Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks uh, to Jeremy for the invitation. Uh, everyone who has sponsored this, uh, Jessica for helping put it together. And I've been to the LBJ library. I've been to UT so many times uh, since I started my career. I do feel at home here. Uh, and I also feel very appreciative of the support uh, I've received uh, over the years, including from the foundation uh, for, for research in various books that I have written. So it's really a, a pleasure to talk about this book in which I try to bring together a lot of things that I've been working on uh, since I was in graduate school. At, I'm going to start with a story at 4 a.m. Uh, on November 23rd, 1963, which was just hours after President Kennedy's tragic assassination in Dallas. Lyndon Johnson was reclining on his bed, meeting with some of his top advisors uh, in an impromptu session, and Johnson of, often would have meetings here, uh, and sometimes uh, Lady Bird would even be present trying to get some sleep. The new presi uh, president told Jack Valenti, Bill Moyers, and Cliff Carter that, quote, I'm going to get Kennedy's tax cut out of the Senate Finance Committee, and we're going to get this economy humming again. Then I'm going to pass Kennedy's civil rights bill, which has been hung up too long in the Congress, and I'm going to pass it without changing a single comma or word. And that, then we'll pass legislation that allows everyone anywhere in the country to vote with all the barriers down, and that's not all. We're going to get a law that says everybody, every boy and girl in this country, no matter how poor, no matter what the color of their skin or the region they come from, is going to be able to get all the education they can take from loan, scholarship, grant, right from the federal government. And after pausing, almost as if to catch his breath, uh, exhausted from his own ambition, he said, and I aim to pass Harry Truman's medical insurance bill that got nowhere before. This story is retold by Jack Valenti, and whether it's 100% accurate or not in terms of what happened, it perfectly captures and portrays Lyndon Johnson's frenetic energy and real ambition, both as a legislator and after 1963 as President of the United States. Johnson was a creature of Congress, a legislator for most of his career, with long experience, someone who was determined from the moment he took over this presidency to do nothing less than to push through Congress a second New Deal. And what's remarkable about Lyndon Johnson's presidency, and I saw the shirt in the, uh, one of the new shirts you have in the LBJ gift shop that lists all the legislation. What's remarkable is how much actually passed in really a relatively short period of time. Voting rights and civil rights, the war on poverty, Medicare and Medicaid, food stamps, Head Start, environmental regulations, immigration reform, federal education assistance, for elementary and secondary education, assistance for higher education, and much, much more, even smaller legislation like the child safety caps on medicine bottles all come out of a period primarily which lasts from 1964 to 1966. So from the vantage point of today, it's pretty remarkable to just see the transformation uh, and legislation that took place. And what's equally uh, impressive and what's equally significant is not just that so much passed through Congress, that so much has lasted since then. Uh, most of the great society proved to be enduring. Even after decades of conservative politics, the age of Reagan, as historians have called it, in the 1970s and the 1980s, and the 1990s through the presidency of George W. Bush, most of the programs that come out of these years have survived. A few have been cut parts of the war on poverty, but most remain the law of the land. And most of you will remember when President Obama's health care proposal was being debated uh, in Washington in 2009 and 2010, a proposal that included cuts to Medicare Tea Party Republicans held up placards to protest 
saying, get your government hands off my Medicare. And the story was funny and uh, kind of revealed a degree of, of hypocrisy for many. But it's also a very revealing story and captures just how ingrained great society programs had become in the political landscape to the point that a conservative could defend this not as a government program and that could defend it from a liberal president uh, warning that the program was going to be attacked. There's many explanations for why this all happened. Why did we have this period in the middle of the 1960s where so much uh, seemed to take shape? One important argument is that this was a liberal era in American politics. It was the last gasp of the New Deal. It was the last period when Americans believed in government and where passing legislation like this was relatively easy. It flowed out of the ideas of the nation. It flowed out of the basic ethics of the electorate. And this is why so much could happen in such a short time. And the second argument that's been um, used very often in recent years to explain what happened revolves around our ideas of presidential power and Lyndon Johnson himself. So the most iconic image of Lyndon Johnson, which I've seen in many pictures of scattered throughout the buildings, is when he gave someone the treatment and where he hovered over opponents or he hovered over his supporters and either seduced them, cajoled them, bullied them, lobbied them into voting for what he wanted to do. And that iconic image is now a way in which we understand why so much happened, often in comparison to the current days, that Lyndon Johnson was a unique president, but a president who understood how to use power in ways that no one, no one, else, uh, no one else has. This, by the way, is different than the treatment of Lyndon Johnson for many decades since the 60s, which was quite negative and really revolved around Vietnam. It revolved around a failed presidency. And in the past 10 years or so, there's been a revival uh, of interest in him and a, and a new way of looking at what he did. The book, The Fierce Urgency of Now, challenges um, both of these arguments and both of these ways uh, of looking at what happened in the mid-1960s. The first is that I don't think the 1960s uh, is always as liberal as it seemed. Uh, there's been a lot of historians in recent years who have been showing that conservatism has deep roots that predate the 1980s. Uh, one historian has written about business organizations, business philanthropists who funded conservative causes since the New Deal. There's been a lot of work on conservative grassroots organizations and activists in the 1960s, not in the 1970s and 80s. And most important for me is the fact that if you turn your attention away from the White House to Capitol Hill, American politics doesn't seem so liberal at all. Until the early 1960s, Congress was dominated from the late 30s to the early 60s by a conservative coalition of Southern Democratic committee chairs and Midwestern Republicans who teamed up on committee and who teamed up on the floor to block everything that was liberal. They blocked proposals for Medicare long before Lyndon Johnson became president. They blocked proposals for aid to the cities. They blocked programs to deal with civil rights. This was something Johnson understood well because of all his decades in Congress. Uh, there was a book I would also recommend by Ira Katz Nelson on the New Deal that looks at Congress rather than FDR and shows you the power of conservative forces during this era of politics. So much that in 1963, at the time of Kennedy's death, if you look at what people were saying about Congress, it sounds a lot like today. Most of the talk was about the dysfunctional Congress. Most of the talk was about a deadlock of democracy, as one political scientist called it, that revolved around this conservative coalition that was preventing Washington from dealing with the major issues of the day. Senator Joseph Clark, a liberal from Pennsylvania, one of the leading liberals of the time, wrote a book in which he called his colleagues the sapless branch of government for their inability to take on 
any of these issues. Life magazine I found in um, December of 1963 for the memorial issue for John F. Kennedy, the lead article was the lethargic Congress versus LBJ, wondering if Johnson, for all his energy and skill, was really going to be able to move forward against a really intransigent institution. There were people like James Eastland, the senator from Mississippi, who liked to joke that he had special pockets put in his pants where he could bury all the civil rights bills that he wouldn't let come up for a vote in his committee. There was Howard Smith, the chairman of the House Rules Committee, a very powerful committee who was from Virginia, who notoriously would prevent uh, all of these liberal measures from either reaching the floor of the House or he would attach bills, uh, rules that were so destructive they were certain to be sidetracked during the vote. During the 50s, uh, Howard Smith once said there was a fire on his barn in Virginia, so he had to leave Washington. And uh, that was the reason that a civil rights bill didn't come up for a vote. And Sam Rayburn said he, couldn't, he knew Howard Smith would do a lot to stop civil rights, but he didn't know he'd resort to arson. The second argument is about Lyndon Johnson. And I think one of the things I learned about Johnson studying this book is he, more than anyone, understood and appreciated the limits of presidential power. Part of what made Johnson special uh, were, were all those years in Congress where he really understood the power of Capitol Hill. Johnson always knew his window for legislating would be very short. He always understood that he had to be very careful or his coalition in Congress could fall apart. Power, he said, the only power I've got is nuclear and I can't even use that. And I think so far in our effort to understand uh, many of the skills and contributions of Lyndon Johnson, sometimes we've gone too far in using that to explain why the world changed during those two years. And we don't put Johnson in the context of the times, particularly understanding why there was a Congress that was willing, after years of gridlock, to move forward on these bills that he sent to them. And one needs to look at the end of his presidency, which I do in the um, final chapters of the book, from the midterm elections of 1966 through the election of 68, just to see a very different Johnson, who with all the same skills and with all the same tactics and acumen, couldn't get the same kind of legislation through Capitol Hill once that conservative coalition returned to power. So my book is a narrative history of the great society with an eye on the relationship between Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the grassroots activists of the period. It starts at the time of John F. Kennedy's death and talks about this sapless branch of government, as a liberal called it. It moves through the middle years between 1964 and 66, capturing all the personalities and all the fights that took place during these years to get the legislation that we ended up with, and then moves to the very contentious years between 1966 and 68, when conservatives reestablished themselves in Congress and started to give Lyndon Johnson a lot of trouble. So what I'd like to do is um, take you through each section by just giving you a few stories uh, from the book to give you a flavor of, of what I'm trying to say uh, in this. So the first part of the book is about the breakthrough. How did we get from that gridlocked period, a Congress that had stopped John F. Kennedy on almost every piece of domestic legislation that he either tried to send to Capitol Hill or legislation he never sent just knowing that it wouldn't pass, how did we get from that to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which in my mind is really the breakthrough that occurs before the 1964 election. And my book does talk a lot about what Lyndon Johnson does and the various uh, very clever tactics that he employs and the way in which he uh, capitalizes on his relationships with members of Congress like Everett Dirksen, the senator from Illinois, the Republican minority leader, the Wizard of Ooze, as many people called him for his long-winded speeches, uh, to move some of this. But I also stress and just remind us of the importance of the civil rights movement during the final throes 
of the battle over this legislation in helping Johnson get a Congress that felt pressure to move forward on the final stages of the bill, that helped create a Congress where many, like Dirksen, concluded that civil rights was an idea whose time had come. And I think the movement is very important in several respects from what I found. The first is the most familiar, and that was the role of the protests at the grassroots level from 63 to 64, either actual protests as occurred in Birmingham or the threat of protests, which were ongoing uh, during the actual Senate debate over civil rights, where activists kept changing public opinion, kept creating the fear on Capitol Hill of genuine civil unrest and civil chaos, and moved Congress to see uh, that this bill was going to be essential. And they were very strategic. One of the things about Martin Luther King, which is remarkable, is that he was a real political strategist. He wasn't just a great orator. He wasn't just a great organizer. He was very shrewd and understood how the protests could help move the Congress uh, so, that, uh, so that the bill didn't die. And so during the Senate filibuster over the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in April and May of 1964, the activists continue to hold smaller protests and to threaten uh, more protests to keep the bill moving along. There are other parts of the civil rights movement that are less familiar. Religious leaders were incredibly important. Religious leaders who were affiliated with the movement in making sure that Senate Republicans voted to end the civil rights filibuster. Basically, because of the math in 1964, the Johnson administration needed a certain number of Republicans to come their way. Otherwise, the Southerners would have enough to sustain a filibuster. So in many states like Illinois, wherever Dirksen was from, or states like Wisconsin, African-American protests could only go so far in moving legislative opinion because the nature of the constituency in those states. So civil rights activists brought to the forefront religious leaders who were sympathetic to the cause, who played a big role in lobbying both at the grassroots level and in Washington to make sure that the civil rights filibuster came to an end. National religious organizations, for example, would coordinate with local preachers in states like Illinois, who would deliver sermons every week with a certain message about the importance of the bill, and who would actually urge congregants to write their members, urging them to let this bill come up for a vote. The uh, Jewish organization, B'nai B'rith, conveys, uh, convenes a meeting in Iowa of local Christian religious leaders to meet with Senator Burke Hickenlooper, an arch-conservative of the period, to put pressure on him to at least let the civil rights bill come up for a vote, and it was very effective. The secret of passing this bill, Hubert Humphrey said, is the religious groups. Just wait until the senators start to hear from them. South Dakota Republican Carl Munt got a call both from a priest and a bishop, one of whom had been an old high school friend who helped persuade him to support cloture. I hope that satisfied those two bishops who called me last night, he said. Religious leaders, even uh, seminarians, went to Washington in April of 1964 as the filibuster was going on, and they conduct a 24-hour vigil to continue and bring media attention to this cause. I learned when giving this uh, talk, a, a version of this talk in New Jersey at my father's synagogue, that he was one of the seminarians who went. Um, so that was a kind of great discovery of the time that I, hadn't, I had really had no idea. And finally, civil rights activists were important partners to Lyndon Johnson during the Senate filibuster for their actual organizational work in Washington. The civil rights movement lobbied. They were an actual lobbying force that was quite important. They did all sorts of things. They sent out information to other liberal senators to make sure that they were constantly keeping track of all the tricks and the speeches that some of the Southern Democrats were doing. And one story uh, that I'll end this part of the talk with, uh, which is a small story, but reflects what civil rights groups were doing to help move this toward 
a conclusion, happened on April 13th, 1964. It was the opening day of, <coughs> of the Washington Senators baseball game uh, season. And Johnson was there uh, with most of the major senators and members of the House. Johnson threw out the opening pitch, and then he went into the stands and sat with everyone from Hubert Humphrey to Richard Russell, and they watched the first inning. Then they watched the second inning. Then they watched the third inning. After the third inning, all of a sudden, an announcement uh, went on the speakers, and it wasn't about the game, it wasn't about a player. It said, all U.S. senators are required to return to the chamber. And everyone in the congressional circles knew what this meant, that the Southerners had called for a quorum call, meaning there had to be 51 senators in the Senate by the time they took the vote, or the legislative day would come to an end, which for Southerners was important because it would allow them to replenish their voices and replenish their strength. Instantly they hear this, Hubert Humphrey gets up and he waves his hand, clearly frustrated to the fans watching because he thought there had been a deal that during the game the Southerners weren't going to call for a quorum call. He instantly storms out, all the Senators follow him except for Richard Russell who sits there waiting behind. He was the one who orchestrated this little annoying trick uh, just to get under their skin. So all the senators leave from the stadium, but this is what happens. They get out of the stadium and the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, which was an umbrella group of civil rights organizations, had a row of cars waiting for the senators to come back. They got in the car and they made the quorum call. Humphrey went triumphantly back into the Senate and says, we've returned and the filibuster has to continue. It's a small story, it's a funny story, but it captures the kind of organizational work that was really important for the civil rights movement. There were also what were called gallery vultures, where um, people allied with the civil rights organizations would sit in the galleries of the Senate and watch everything pre-C-SPAN in terms of what was happening to kind of monitor the events. Second story comes back to my dissertation. It's had this guy, Wilbur Mills, um, and it's about the period that followed the 1964 election. Uh, this, this, this is another important part, a very basic part of the mid-1960s that we need to understand if we talk about the Great Society. The election of 1964. This was a hugely important election. Lyndon Johnson defeats um, uh, Barry Goldwater in a landslide and Democrats will obtain large majorities in both the House and the Senate. How does this have an effect? So uh, before 1964, another big piece of legislation was Medicare. Uh, Medicare had been an idea that had been floating around Washington and proposed on Capitol Hill since the late 1950s. And the idea was to provide hospital insurance for the elderly paid for through Social Security taxes. But every time that liberals in Congress proposed it, and every time that John F. Kennedy had proposed Medicare, it went nowhere. Medicare faced fierce opposition from the American Medical Association, the Organization of Physicians, which mounted a campaign that made the attacks on President Obama look pretty mild. They called Medicare socialized medicine. The AMA sent out pamphlets that were distributed in physician's offices that patients would pick up after leaving their doctor where they would read, if this bill passes, next time you come there'll be a government bureaucrat making decisions about your health. There was a record that Ronald Reagan recorded which the wives of AMA members would play at coffee clutches, in which Reagan, in his very charismatic style, warned that healthcare always sounded good and it was a nice thing to do, but it was the opening wedge for socialism to take over the country. And it was a really intense campaign that the AMA put on. And the AMA had strong allies on Capitol Hill. And one of the chief allies was Wilbur Mills, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee who until 1964 wouldn't let Medicare come up for a vote. He warned some of the same arguments made by the AMA, and he also warned it would be too expensive. It would basically bankrupt Social Security because they'd be paying for health care. 
And John F. Kennedy couldn't move uh, Wilbur Mills. And despite our image that Kennedy was dispassionate and disengaged, he actually is very aggressive in trying to promote Medicare. He holds a big rally in Madison Square Garden in, Cong in 1962 that's televised, in which he says, write your members because the AMA is basically doing something that's immoral. They're lying about what this program is. And he's really trying to move this, but Wilbur Mills says he won't bring it up for a vote. In 1964, after Kennedy's death, Johnson is very determined to move forward with Medicare, but Johnson has no success in moving Wilbur Mills. Even after Kennedy's death, even with all the sympathy that exists toward, fit, fit, uh, toward finishing John F. Kennedy's agenda, with Medicare really being the top issue, Wilbur Mills will not budge. But then came the election of 1964. Then came the election of 1964, and that changed everything. That election, first of all, discredits uh, conservative republicanism. At the time, many Republicans leave this election thinking the last thing they want is to look like Barry Goldwater. And one of the main issues in the campaign had been Medicare. Johnson blasts some very powerful television spots, not the Daisy ad, but spots that reminded voters that Barry Goldwater didn't support Medicare, that Barry Goldwater wanted to tear up Social Security. And many Republicans read into this election, they can't stand on the extreme right. They're going to have to work with the administration on bills. And many say Medicare is a priority at this point if we're going to keep our party alive. And then there was the math. Again, 295 Democrats in the House after the election, 68 Democrats in the Senate, and the balance between the liberal Democrats and the Southern Democrats had shifted. Liberals in Congress had the numbers, they had the determination, they had the energy to move forward on domestic legislation at a fast clip, and they were ready to do so. They even reorganized the committees on Congress so that they placed two new Democrats on the Ways and Means Committee, both of whom are Medicare supporters, and the Republicans place a Medicare supporter on the committee, so that even if Wilbur Mills kept saying no, there were now enough votes on Ways and Means to vote it out of the committee without him. Wilbur Mills knew he had lost. A month after the election, he says he was open now to considering a bill. By January, he's making it very clear that he's going to support the administration's plan. By February of 1965, Republicans are, op are offering their own versions of Medicare. John Burns, the ranking Republican on Ways and Means, offers a program that will cover doctor's insurance costs, not simply hospital costs. And then there's another version that proposes a program of health care for people who are poor. And then in March of 1965, Wilbur Mills, who had been obstructing this for years, turns around and puts together a package called the three-layer cake, in which he puts all the programs into one big bill. And we have Medicare, which covers hospital costs and doctor's costs. And we also have Medicaid all coming together that year. The story of Wilbur Mills is very instructive because it really captures, in my mind, the impact that election had on the tenor of politics uh, on the Hill and the way in which it created a really exceptional legislative environment that Lyndon Johnson brilliantly took advantage of when it emerged. The final part of the book covers the years from 1966 to 1968, and these are obviously the most difficult and contentious years for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it starts with the midterm elections of 1966, where Republicans mount a very fierce campaign that target Lyndon Johnson uh, as a way to attack Democrats. They focus on Vietnam. They focus on arguments that the deficit is rising too fast. And they capitalize on a racial backlash that's starting to take place. In 1966, Johnson, as the third pillar of the civil rights revolution had proposed an open housing bill, which is what I want to talk about as the final story. And it was a piece of legislation which would end segregation in the sale or rental of housing. It was a very bold bill. 
Johnson believed that this was really essential to completing the civil rights revolution. And Martin Luther King had moved to Chicago, where he moved into an apartment in a slum uh, to bring attention to problems such as housing. Well, the bill goes to the Hill in early 1966, and immediately it causes all kinds of turmoil. Republicans like Everett Dirksen instantly make clear this is a bill they won't support. Whereas Dirksen worked with the administration on voting rights and on civil rights, he won't do so on open housing. More problematic is the fact that many liberal Democrats in northern states were too scared to support the bill as well. They were seeing that in cities like Chicago, many white ethnic working class Democratic constituents were reacting very badly to a bill that would force certain rules on the sale or rental of housing and integrate communities. And the real estate industry mounts a really fierce campaign warning that this legislation is threatening the basic property that every family depended on. By the midterms of 66 in November, the backlash is pretty severe. Uh, some very liberal Democrats are suffering as a result of it, the most famous of which is Paul Douglas, a liberal Democrat from Illinois. He's one of the icons of civil rights, the icons of liberalism, and he is suffering as a result of what's going on in response to this bill. He's campaigning against a Republican named Charles Percy, who's a very good-looking, attractive, charismatic businessman uh, that one newspaper says looks as if he had been cast for the Senate by Hollywood, uh, who's actually moderate on civil rights, but is uh, winning over votes because of the backlash in very Democratic constituencies in Chicago. And there's an amazing conversation here in the library where Johnson calls Paul Douglas in October of 1966 and says, should I come to the state? Should I campaign and try to help you? And Douglas is very clear, oh, I don't think you should do that. And he makes it clear it's not going to help him because he says the sentiment is really quite poor right now towards civil rights, and it's certainly not going to help you, Mr. President. Uh, and that trip doesn't happen. The bill dies in 1966. In the 66 midterms, that conservative coalition of Southern Democrats and Republicans regain their strength in both the House of Senate. And then in 1967, they take up the bill again, but it really goes nowhere. Um, most of 1967 is consumed with debates over Vietnam, which is uh, becoming the issue of the time. And most importantly, uh, Johnson is facing off against conservatives in Congress. They are the principal source of, of the problem with Vietnam for him, in that they are demanding that if he wants the money to pay for Vietnam, he is going to have to start accepting cuts to his domestic uh, programs. So in 1967, the housing bill languishes, and what emerges at the forefront of congressional debate is the battle over guns or butter. Johnson wants both and insists the nation can afford it. Conservatives like Wilbur Mills, like Everett Dirksen, are saying, Mr. President, it's guns or butter, not both. And a lot of his ability to pass more uh, of the big legislation is starting to diminish. In 1968, the housing bill finally passes, but it only passes right after Martin Luther King's assassination. And the assassination results in uh, rioting in many major cities, and that same sense of fear on Capitol Hill reemerges, and they do pass a bill, but the final housing bill is a shell. It's a pale kind of version of what was originally imagined. It doesn't have any enforcement mechanism to speak of, and it only covered a narrow stock of the nation's housing stock. Uh, it had all kinds of exemptions which allowed people to get out of it. So it was an important bill, but it certainly wasn't the bill that Johnson initially wanted. And to understand how that happened, you have to understand the changes that were occurring in Congress. Johnson by 67 and 68 is very frustrated when people are talking to him about why he can't do more why he won't do more, because in his mind, it's become politically not impossible, but very difficult to achieve what had happened a few years earlier. When one advisor asks him, why can't you do more, people are saying, 
to get your bills through Congress? Why can't you control these budget debates more effectively? After all, they said, you're the master of the Senate. So why can't you do what needs to be done? And Johnson is clearly angry on the tape. And he says, master of the Senate? I'm not the master of a damn thing. We can't make this Congress do one damn thing that I know of. Johnson often said that every Congress got the best of every president, and it would do the same to him. One of his most enduring memories was 1937 and 38, when he came to Congress, and he saw this conservative coalition form and crush many of FDR's ideas right after FDR's great landslide victory in 1936. So this is the story of the book. It's not meant at all to diminish the skill and importance of Lyndon Johnson, just the opposite. But it really tries to argue that to understand why presidents like LBJ and others have had these moments of success, we have to understand the forces from grassroots to voters to liberals uh, or conservatives organized in Washington who create a different kind of environment on Capitol Hill. In many ways, what's most impressive about Lyndon Johnson is his understanding of power in Washington, including his understanding both of the limits of presidential power and the immense role of Congress. And so when the window opened, one of the things he does is move with that frenetic energy because he more than most people understood that that was going to end very quickly, as it does when he uh, sees the midterms take away those majorities. So in the end, this is a book about history. I try to capture all the great personalities of the period, from Johnson to Dirksen to King and others. Uh, but I do also hope in some ways it's instructive today as we live through an era where many people feel quite bleak about the possibility of Washington working and feel that we are in a moment when our nation's government has become gridlocked once again. Thank you very much.